Welcome back to the Actuality Podcast. In our last episode, we witnessed Jacob's bold experiments with the memory projection machine. As Jacob's journey continues to unfold, so too does his budding connection with Zoe. In this episode, join us as Jacob and Zoe's feelings continue to blossom. But as their bond strengthens, so do the consequences of Jacob's experiments. Tune in as we navigate this intricate labyrinth of memory and emotion on the Actuality Podcast. If you guys could use the projection machine to change your past, what would you do? Zoe asked, leaning toward Dean and Jacob and giving them an inquisitive look. She meant the question as more of a joke, but Dean and Jacob both took the question as seriously as any other. Hmm. I think I would go back and spend more time playing video games, Dean said, staring through Zoe as if he had entered his own world at the thought of endless video games. Jacob immediately burst out laughing. More video games? <laughs> I'm sure you've played your fair share. Eh, wrong. I was actually a very serious student. It's just that sometimes I kind of regret not spending my time having more fun and doing things I enjoy. I'd spend more time with my dad. He and I weren't that close, but ever since he died, I regret not spending all of the time with him that I could. Zoe said. Jacob could tell that she meant what she said, and the topic kind of distressed her. Jacob, how about you? You haven't answered. Zoe smiled. Me? Uh, my mother. Jacob gave a shy smile and then looked away, pretending to be reading the papers he had piled in front of him. The table was silent for a while after he and Zoe mentioned their parents. A sad topic no matter how their wishes were worded. Well, even if you did go back, there wouldn't be much use, right? You said she died giving birth to you, didn't you? If that's the case, then you would only see her dying again. It's better to keep what you have. I don't think you truly want to see that. Dean said before Zoe chimed in. Yeah, that's a tough one. As much as I hate to admit it, I'm going to have to agree with Dean on this one. Things fell awkwardly silent for a moment. The three of them returned to their work, diligently riding away while ignoring each other, waiting for the tension and awkwardness to leave. Jacob looked up from his notebook when Dean got up from his chair leaving for one of the computers on the other side of the room. Throughout the rest of the class, Jacob found himself wondering if he actually could go back and see his mother. A cheesy drawing of objects and light rays was scribbled onto the whiteboard. It was Professor Melbourne's artistic attempt at illustrating the complex theory of time cloaking. He turned to write something on the board, but it was more of his incoherent scrawl and no one but he could tell what it said. This was the usual practice in the classroom, and most times when people had a question, they got the professor to explain it instead of relying on whatever it was he wrote on the board. Light can be manipulated in many ways, as we have demonstrated many, many times through various scientific sectors. What I would like to introduce to you all today is yet another method, but one that is kept mostly as a theory in the subject of memory projection and special relativity. Professor Melbourne began clearing his throat and placing the marker he'd been using on the table in front of him. Time cloaking. Achieved through refractions of light to create, in effect, small gaps in time as a beam originates from one medium and is received by another medium, which can render bits of the beam invisible. Particles, information, even an object, can exist within these gaps, while appearing to the world outside the beam to not be there at all. As it relates to memory projection, time cloaking in theory can occur in a similar way. As a memory is projected from the temporal lobe through the refracted lenses, time gaps can be experienced. Gaps in time that affect how an event is perceived from one person to the next. For example, in accessing a memory, a person could easily change details of an event in the past. Remember, though, that projected memories are in their simplest form transmissions of particles or information as light beams. Making changes to an event, then, is essentially bending the event, a refraction of the beam. Thus, the change made in the past could fall into a time gap and be hidden in the stream of time. The result? With the change to the event hidden from the memory, not everything related to that event would change in the present. We can think of the present as the view of the event outside of the being. In particular, the memory others have of the event in the present quite possibly would remain intact, but the change would also have become truth in the present, though undetected, meaning that 
A person in the present would remember the event as it happened in the past, even if some change affected how the event played out in the future. The theory states that any changes made to an event would manifest once the one who manipulated the event has left the memory. This leads to another part of the theory that touches on the possibility of personal death within a memory. Simply stated, as of now, it's believed to be impossible to die from time travel in this method, a similar fashion to how you cannot actually die in your dreams. Professor Melbourne stated, he spotted a student in the back of the class with his hand raised to ask a question. He pointed to the student and nodded for him to speak. What happens to someone's real body if they die inside the memory? Do they wake up unharmed or does something happen to them? The student asked. An excellent question. Relating to the theory of time masking, it's understood that dying in a memory theoretically would cause your physical body to experience shock. The same as you might sweat or experience increased heart rate after a nightmare. Memories travel along a series of synapses in the brain. Think of them as information highways. One thing that has been revealed in time is that the brain cannot process a person seeing their own death. Think about it. When was the last time you actually saw yourself die in a dream? Generally, you wake up just short of the occurrence. Likely, should a person die within a memory, the brain would be unable to process the event. In such a case, synaptic pruning would possibly take place, cutting off access to the memory to prevent any chance of shock. You wouldn't quite forget the event, but it would be impossible to access it again, a form of post-traumatic shock response as a protective mechanism. Professor Melbourne answered. Another student raised their hand to ask a question. So, if you die, does your body remain there or would you just disappear? What happens? All interpretations of the theory state that a person gradually awakens from a memory. Because of this, all traces of the person would steadily be removed from the memory whether they died in it or not. Thus, the body in the memory would in theory remain in the memory for whatever time it would take for the person to fully awaken from the memory. And then it would just simply no longer exist in that memory. This is all untested theory, of course. Jacob entered the lone, quiet pawn shop that sat just off the edge of campus. The light ding of the bell on the door echoed loudly inside the store. The clerk didn't greet him as he entered, just acknowledged his existence with a quick glance up from the counter. He wanted to avoid confrontation with the clerk as much as possible. He didn't walk straight to the glass cases and instead roamed down the aisles of nameless junk that littered the store. Of course, he couldn't find what he was looking for. With an audible sigh, he acknowledged the fact that only an idiot would leave a weapon unsecured and that he had to speak with the clerk either way. Walking up to the counter, he caught the eyes of the clerk and gave him a smile. It was not returned. Jacob looked down at the glass cases that lie in the counters of the shop, immediately spotting what he was looking for. A gun. Uh, I'd like to look at that one, Jacob said, pointing at the small pistol. Yeah, okay, the man said unlocking the case and placing the gun on the glass surface for Jacob to examine. How much? Jacob asked, trying to seem disinterested. He knew that some places like this were shady and would up the price if too much interest was shown. Two hundred, and all sales are final, the clerk said, and Jacob reached for his wallet, staring at the clerk without saying a word. After a few seconds of fiddling with his wallet, he placed a few bills on the counter. Picking the bills up hastily, the man counted them and looked back at Jacob. Tell me something. What do you need this for, kid? He asked, as if he was only somewhat skeptical about selling a weapon to someone who appeared underage. Jacob looked at him with surprise as he wasn't expecting the man to question his purchase and he hadn't prepared a story in case he needed one. Protection. You know, just in case. Jacob replied, wanting to leave it at that. The clerk nodded. Mm. Fair enough. Here's a bit of street wisdom for you, though. Don't ever pull this thing out unless you plan to use it, you understand? Don't bluff. He waved Jacob off and turned away, sorting through something behind the counter. The lab seemed darker than usual as he closed the door behind him that night. He'd learned the janitor's cleaning routine which limited the chances of encountering a locked lab door. There was an exciting energy surging through Jacob. The professor's lecture on time cloaking with all of its theories had lit a curious fire in him. He wanted to test some of those theories, 
try something completely different from his previous experiments. He felt the mischievous spirit, something he had begun to feel recently. That feeling drove him to want to try something risky and more daring. He hadn't been many places or done many out-of-the-ordinary things in his life, so he held a few memories that could be described as exciting, but certainly none that were risky. There was the trip to Belgium, however, probably the most different thing he had ever done. Earlier in the day, sitting in his dorm, he replayed thoughts of accessing the memory of that trip as the subject of a projection experiment in class. Still, finally kissing the girl he'd remembered wanting to kiss and having her slap his face wasn't his idea of exciting or daring. His fingers tapped wildly on his laptop keyboard, searching the internet for major events in Belgium's history. Maybe he could add some excitement to his memory. As he searched, one event tickled his fancy and got his blood rushing. 1989 in Antwerp, Belgium, the world's biggest diamond heist had taken place. It was later recorded that a team of seven men attempted to steal approximately 100 million worth of diamonds, cash, and other jewelry from the Antwerp World Financial Center. The more he read, the more the idea began to swirl in his head to go to Belgium on the day of the heist. Of course, he hadn't even been born when it happened, but in his thirst for something different, he completely overlooked the date. He'd been to Belgium, and the heist happened in Belgium. And based on Professor Melbourne's theories to him, that was all that mattered. So there he sat, reclining in the seat of the projection machine, easing the thoughts into his mind. He didn't have an exact plan, only an idea, but that was enough for him to get started. As he felt himself drifting, Jacob focused his thoughts on Belgium, allowing his mind to fill with the details he'd earlier read, intertwining them with memories of his family vacation from years ago. It took a moment, but gradually he was no longer looking up at a sea of white. He was staring at the Antwerp Financial Center. The building itself was nothing special, but inside was something that people treasured very much. While he waited in the street, he shoved his hand into his pocket and found that the gun he'd purchased had traveled with him into the memory as expected. He hadn't been too sure if it would work, but he reasoned that if he could take something out of a memory, he should be able to bring something inside. Thankfully for him, he was right. Otherwise, his entire plan for the night would be a waste. The early morning air was moderate in Belgium. The streets dark and lonely, lit only by faded lamps that lined the streets. No one seemed to pass through the area during early hours, but daybreak would bring bustling crowds for sure. The quiet suited Jacob just fine. An audience wasn't preferred. He waited and waited, knowing that soon it would be time for action. Two of the robbers had begun the slow process of working their way to the vault inside the financial center. One behind the other. The man behind mimicking the steps of the man in front. Under his breath, the front man muttered a pattern. A pattern that he'd spent months learning and mastering to navigate through the building's pressurized floor undetected. One step right, then four forward, one man said, then paused. He scanned the floor and panicked because the tiles for some reason looked different in front of him than the rest of the floor. He took a deep breath and continued. Two steps left, then one, two, three, four steps over, he mumbled. He tiptoed one final step, passing the last pressurized mark hidden beneath the tiles and was in the clear. The man behind him followed into the clear as well. The second man turned back to the other five men waiting across the room and gave them a quick thumbs up to let them know that both men had made it across without a problem. The two men gazed at two metal levers spaced five or six feet apart and protruding from the wall they had just reached. Each man grasped the lever in his hand and locked eyes with the other to synchronize their movement. The first man counted one, two, three. Simultaneously, both men pulled hard on their respective levers and turned as they saw the vault's cage begin to rise. With a wave, the other men rushed over to the vault to start picking through the goods. It wasn't long before the crew had looted the entirety of the vault and made their way outside. Each man emerged with a duffel bag holding portions of the 100 million. The crew paused in an alley briefly, changing their clothes from their dark jumpsuits and masks into more casual street clothes. Once he heard the movement in the alley, Jacob moved in, standing on the street opposite their escape vehicle and staring them down. Jacob didn't move or make a sound at first, going undetected by the men who obviously were focused on trying to finish their change and get out of the area before they were caught. 
he pulled the gun out and pointed it in their direction. Prodded by the clerk's reminder, he sent a warning shot into the air. The men caught sight of him, and one man reached for his waistband. Jacob hesitated for a moment. The clerk's warning echoed in his head. Don't ever pull this thing out unless you plan to use it, you understand? Don't bluff. The men froze. The look on their faces showing Jacob that though they hadn't taken him seriously at first, they did now. A confident smile curled on Jacob's lips while he watched them silently freak out in front of him. He lifted his chin in the direction of two of the robbers nearest him. You two, get over here, Jacob said. The robbers seemed to discuss it for a moment and then agreed, likely either just to humor him or to ensure that at least some of their team escaped. They hadn't the slightest clue of Jacob's intentions. Do it now. Hurry up, Jacob added gruffly. The two men approached him cautiously as the other five ran off toward the getaway vehicle. Who are you? One of the men asked, trying not to sound frightened over the fact that Jacob had a loaded gun and apparently wasn't afraid to use it. Jacob laughed. <laughs> the person who just saved your butts. You'll thank me later, he said, intentionally being vague, a skill he'd picked up from Zoe. The two men looked at him with an expression blending a mixture of bewilderment and anger, both of them believing that the heist had been ruined by some kid. Jacob pointed the gun at one of the men. Do anything stupid and I'll shoot. And call the cops. Just do what I tell you and nobody gets hurt. Jacob said. The men looked at each other and sighed, seeming to think they had little to lose at that point. Jacob ordered the men to turn around. Once they were facing away from him, Jacob grabbed several zip ties from his coat pocket. He handed them to the men and ordered them to strap one around both of their hands and then connect their hands together. The men grunted in frustration and annoyance, and Jacob ordered them to sit. Jacob kept the gun trained on the two men and joined them on the cement. They eyed him warily as he pulled out his phone, flicking through his apps until he found an English radio station located in France. He kept the radio low the woman's voice not really important, just breaking the silence between the three. How in the world did you even know we'd be here? One of them asked. Jacob didn't respond, only looked at them with caution, pretending to listen to the radio. The other two looked at each other after a minute of no response. What on earth do you want with us, and what kind of radio is stuff? It took Jacob a moment to figure out that the men may be confused by his modern cell phone. The year was 1989. Jacob cracked a smile. Eh, you don't need to worry about any of that. Just sit quiet. Jacob said as the news reporter on the radio burst into an urgent news report. Just moments ago, local police apprehended five men on the highway. A search of the men's vehicle revealed duffel bags of jewelry, gold, euros, and U.S. currency. Authorities are currently questioning the men about the fine. It is believed that there are no other accomplices at large. The news reported. The broadcast went on, but Jacob wasn't much interested in listening to the rest. He looked back at the two robbers who stared at him in disbelief. Jacob couldn't help but laugh at their expressions. He got up and started walking away, leaving the men to free themselves. Hey kid, come back here for a moment, one of the robbers said. Jacob looked back for a moment with his pistol still drawn. He walked back slowly toward the men. What? In the back, on top. Take it, it's yours. The man who called him back said. Jacob hesitated leaning in to sift through the bag. There was a bundle sitting atop the rest of the bag's contents. Not knowing what it was, Jacob took it and hid it under his jacket. He nodded to the men and walked off. Jacob's heart raced as he turned off the street and out of the men's view. He had just held two people at gunpoint and he had altered the events around one of the largest heists in history. Excited, he walked down the empty street and opened the bag the men gave him, finding two neat stacks of American $100 bills. Jacob awoke to find the gun back in his pocket and the bag of money clenched in his fist. He jumped out of the chair, gathered his things, and tidied up the lab before heading back to his dorm. Jacob wanted to record his findings in his notebook before leaving the lab, but he decided it would be best for it to wait for when he wouldn't need to worry about being interrupted. On the way to his dorm, he thought about what he had done. One of his biggest concerns was about how much of the past he had changed with this simple intervention but there were few ways for him to actually discover the changes that he had made. When he got to his dorm, he popped open his laptop. He took a look at old news articles about the Antwerp financial heist. He had reviewed the same articles and reports before entering the memory, 
to gather a bit more information to educate himself on how the heist had happened and several other details he deemed useful. The reports now noted that there were only five people apprehended for participating in the heist, rather than the seven that had been mentioned before. The other change was that 71 million had been recovered instead of the full 100 million that had been stolen. Jacob sat back against his chair to distance himself from the computer screen, staring at it with his eyes wide with shock. Actually, worked. He had successfully changed an event in the past. Not just an event that changed his life, but an event that likely changed the lives of others, be it good or bad. He knew he had at least changed the lives of the two men who had escaped from the heist, but who else had been affected? After going through the articles and several other related websites, Jacob was satisfied with the outcome of his experiment. As far as he could tell, there hadn't been any serious consequences for the change in history. He took the time to note down a few things about his experiences the previous night, as well as all the ideas and thoughts he had about the outcome of the heist and his experiment. He made extensive notes about how it was possible to bring items in and out of his memories and back into the present, and then paused. He sat and pondered a moment. That feeling for something edgy still tingled in him. He wasn't quite able to explain the feeling. From the moment he changed the fight with the bully in elementary school, he had begun to feel different. But nothing as strong as he was feeling now. Were these feelings another side effect of his tampering with his past? He didn't worry too much about the change as he was confident that he was still himself. However, he still went on to make further notes about his feelings and the things that he had thought changed about him for future reference. The only thing that troubled him about the whole feeling different ordeal was that if the time travel had affected his personality negatively, he wondered if the same would have happened to others because of him. He recorded several pages of notes and thoughts into his journal and tried to leave it at that for the day. He walked over to the bed and stared down at the bag of money. He sifted through the bills and counted them. He separated a portion of it and placed the bulk of it in an old suitcase in the corner by his bed. Professor Melbourne dropped his assorted mail on the edge of his desk and sat down with an exhausted sigh. He had intended to look at the mail later. He had several papers to grade and had to prepare lessons for the next week. But the letter on top of the pile caught his eye. He picked it up and read the outside and was stunned to see that the letter had been sent by his one and only brother. Surely there had to be a mistake. He tore the letter open, the paper shaking in his trembling hands as he unfolded it to skim the contents. The professor was baffled, as the letter was definitely from his brother, stating that he was coming to America and was wondering if he could visit. Impossible. The only problem was that Melbourne knew for a certainty that his brother still had 15 or 20 years remaining of a 40-year prison sentence. There was no way he would have been released from prison so early. Jacob realized that his heart was racing when he was walking down the sidewalk toward the bank. He already had a local account with the bank, but even with prior knowledge of their system, he still had to manually make large deposits. He caught a glimpse of himself in the shiny glass doors as he opened them and walked inside the bank, subconsciously taking note of the sign on the door that said they would be closed for the next two days. There were several other people in the bank, but they were all in a line at the account services desk, leaving one of the ladies at the front available. He walked up and summoned all of his confidence as he approached, offering her a friendly smile before speaking. Hi, I'd like to make a deposit, Jacob said. The teller looked at him and returned his smile. Sure. Do you have your membership card? She asked. Jacob pulled out his wallet, searching for his card and handing it to her over the counter. After a few seconds of typing and referring to his card, she pulled up his account and placed his membership card back on the counter for him to retrieve. All right. And how much would you like to deposit? She asked, looking at him expectantly while he sifted through his pockets. He placed a bunch of his $100 bills on the counter, and the teller began counting them. Several times during her counting, she eyed him suspiciously, and Jacob did his best to act casual. She slowed down as she got near the bottom of the stack of bills, but in the end, she seemed to accept them. So, the 50000 Please hold on one moment. She said, turning and leaving the counter. As she left, Jacob began to feel that something wasn't right. 
Worry began to rise inside his gut while he awaited for the woman to return, which she did, but a few minutes later than he had hoped, and she was accompanied by the branch manager. His worried feelings transformed into nervous knots in his stomach that built up as they neared and approached him from behind the counter. Uh, Mr. Alton, I, I'm Thomas. This is quite a large deposit for you. Uh, being that it is cash, we'll need you to verify the source of the funds, if you don't mind. I, uh, I'd rather not say. Mm-hmm. If you can't tell me, I'm afraid you'll have to speak with the authorities. Protocol. I hope you understand. My parents... Jacob started, but before he could say anything, the teller cut in. I've already contacted the police. Both Jacob and the branch manager sighed. The branch manager pulled the teller further behind the counter, and he seemed to scold her. She walked away, and the manager came back to talk to Jacob. Jacob was annoyed that he hadn't gotten the opportunity to defend himself, but he knew that there was little he could do about it now but comply with their orders and see where it led him. Uh, I'm terribly sorry. There's not much I can do now. Just wait here with me. They'll be here soon. True to his word, the police came to the bank and picked up Jacob shortly after. The room was bright and empty and boring as Jacob had expected an interrogation room to look. The detective sat on the other side of the table, his hands crossed in front of him. Mr. Olson, is it? Or can I call you Jacob? Uh, I'm Detective Jensen. At the moment, I'm just looking to ask a few questions. He smiled, reaching his hand across the table to shake Jacob's hand, but he didn't budge. The detective sighed and crossed his arms on the table. So, anything you want to tell me? Fifty grand is a lot of money for a college kid, Jacob. We've just checked your records, and I'll be honest with you. I'm a bit confused. The Olsons, right? A construction worker and a teacher. Not exactly jobs with lots of disposable income, if you don't mind me saying. He said, raising an eyebrow and hoping for a response. The detective smiled to himself when Jacob moved to respond. Jacob sighed. There's nothing to tell. I won the money gambling, and all I wanted was to invest it. Gambling? Gambling. Come on, kid. Gambling where? Vegas? Listen, you be straight up with me, and I'll be straight up with you. And right now, I'll be straight up and tell you that I feel like you're jerking me around. Jacob realized then that the story that he'd managed to fabricate while buying his time with silence wasn't too well thought out. And instead, he dodged all of the questions asked. No sense digging himself into more trouble with lies. There wasn't much he could say anyway. But after hours of getting nowhere with the interrogation, the detective gave up. Look, am I under arrest or what? Jacob asked. Detective Jensen sighed and reached into his coat pocket. No, you can leave whenever you want, kid. But take this and call me once you get a better story. <laughs> Gambling. So tell us, how has school been so far, kiddo? Jean, Jacob's foster mother, asked between bites of food. Jacob had had a rough start to his winter break with nearly getting arrested and all, but he didn't feel that his foster parents needed to know that. He was just glad that he hadn't needed to cancel his plans to fly out to see them for the rest of the break. He had been anticipating coming home for a visit for a while now, and there wasn't much time left before classes resumed. It's been pretty interesting, actually. A bit of a wake-up call from high school. Jacob laughed and his foster parents were quick to follow. Jacob never was much for school. It had been a surprise to his foster parents when he received a scholarship to attend the university. His foster parents had taken him out for dinner at a local Chinese restaurant, and they were talking over appetizers while waiting for the main course. Their server came over with all of their meals, giving them a hulking plate of chow mein and sweet and sour chicken, along with a huge bowl of wonton soup. She took up all of the plates left over from the appetizers, briefly told them to enjoy the meal, and then finally left. When she did, Jacob spoke up again. I actually have a question for you guys. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking a lot about my birth mother. In all honesty, I really don't know anything about her. I was thinking that maybe you guys might be able to tell me what you knew about her. His foster parents were silent for a while as they thought over the question. He watched as they eyed each other, silently conversing over what to discuss and what to leave unknown. Jacob didn't press them. He knew that they would give him the answers he needed. Anything else, he would have to dig up another time. 
we knew her for a bit before you were born, which is why we were so easily able to adopt you. Your mother was very beautiful. What I remember most were her icy blue eyes. The description his foster mother gave him seemed to trigger a long-forgotten memory in his mind. His thoughts became fuzzy as the memory pushed its way into the front of his mind, demanding his immediate attention. The memory was from when he was a younger child, just a boy, still in preschool. He had been playing outside with some other children, but the ball they were playing with bounced off into the field. Jacob ran over to retrieve it, and as he did, he noticed a woman with icy blue eyes staring into the schoolyard and watching the children play. The memory was startling, and Jacob wasn't sure whether or not he had imagined it. He managed to pull himself together and once again focused on his foster parents. Is there anything else you can remember about her? Jacob asked, anxious for more information. What about the day you adopted me? Jacob asked. Jean smiled, and Jacob knew that it was a happy memory for the both of them. We got a call from the adoption agency early one morning. The lady who called told us that there was a little boy who would be a perfect match for us and that the agency wanted us to come in that morning to see him. Of course, that turned out to be you, but there was a condition laid upon the adoption. It wouldn't happen without the mother being able to meet us and approve of the child being transferred to us. There was no doubt that we would meet her, but we found it to be a strange request. We were actually surprised to find out that we already knew her. Your mother was quite charming, I do say. His foster mother finished. Jacob liked the idea that his mother had in some way wanted him to go to a good home. But why had she given him up? He was dying for more answers. That's it? Nothing else? Jacob asked. His foster parents had a look of concern. All I think we should talk about tonight. Besides, I want to hear more about that campus, his foster father said. After they finished eating and were getting ready to leave, he placed a hand on Jacob's shoulder. He had noticed Jacob's nicely shaped biceps and seemed shocked. You been working out? Keep it up. Looking good, his foster father encouraged. The three of them left the restaurant. Jacob still with more questions than he had gotten answers. Winter break flew by, and before Jacob knew it, it was time to head back to school. Even if he wasn't too fond of leaving his foster parents again, the time he spent with them was great. As a bonus, he'd learned a bit about his birth mother. He was a little relieved to get back to school. After all, he did miss his friends. It was Saturday afternoon and Jacob had just gotten off his flight. He already had plans to head out with Dean and Zoe. He headed back to his dorm first, of course, and got situated. He was excited to see his friends again, but it was still hours before he had to meet with them. Instead of doing what he typically did and either sleep or browse the internet, he cleaned his dorm. It didn't really strike him as something important, but... At the moment, he just felt like he ought to. He spent some time gathering his dirty clothes and piling them in the clothes hamper, gathering his dishes and bringing them back out to the sink in the kitchen, and sorting out whatever else he could find on the floor that didn't actually belong there. Jacob was surprised when he realized the time of three hours had already passed, and he didn't think he was anywhere near done. He gathered his stuff and headed off, meeting with Zoe and Dean at the campus lounge and bar. Dean and Zoe made small talk on the way there, but Jacob hadn't been all that interested in talking. He listened to the two of them talk and spoke when he was addressed, but otherwise he was content to just remain inside himself. Jacob moved ahead of his friends to open the door for them once they got to the lounge. He caught sight of the larger man who had tried to hit on Zoe the last time they'd been there. As they went inside, it became clear that the guy seemed to recognize him too. But Jacob didn't react to his burning stare. Instead, he simply stared back at him summoning all of his confidence to walk past with the smirk in place. Jacob half expected the guy to jump down from the bar stool and try to stir up more trouble, but he remained seated, glaring at Jacob and Zoe with his arms crossed. Jacob met his gaze again as he and his friend sat at one of the empty tables in the lounge, and they never looked back. The confidence poured out of Jacob, and apparently it was visible to the other guy too. Jacob zoned out as he thought back to how the elementary school situation had a major effect on him. The change in him was obvious to others as well. A cute, curvy waitress came over to take their orders. She stared at Jacob with a flirtatious smile as she waited for him to order. Hello, Earth to Jacob, Zoe joked. But Jacob truly was staring off into space. The sudden motion in front of him seemed to snap him out of it, though. Oh, uh, sorry. I'll just have some fries and a ginger ale, he said. The waitress took note of his order on her notepad and sauntered off. 
Jacob had returned to his almost out-of-it state when he realized Dean was staring at him. What is it? No, it, it's just that I hadn't noticed until now, but have you been working out, dude? Dean asked. His brow furled while he examined Jacob from the side. Eh, a little. Jacob joked, plastering a fake smile on his face. Well, it's working. Just saying. Zoe said, tilting her head to take another look at him. Jacob sighed and his gaze met with Zoe's. In that moment, it seemed like nothing else mattered. Something inside of him clicked when he looked into her gorgeous eyes. A phantom of a smile etched on his lips, and it seemed like the words just came out. We'll be right back, Dean. Jacob guided Zoe outside the building and into a quiet enclave around the corner. Dean watched them as they left out, but said nothing. He didn't mind being alone while the two of them went to talk in private. What's up? I've been meaning to tell you something for a while. Jacob paused, wondering how in the world he was going to word his thoughts in a way that she'd understand and not make a fool of himself. I like you, Zoe. I like you a lot. You're an incredibly amazing and smart person, and sorry if I'm catching you off guard with this, but I just thought it's best if I just come straight out with it. N no, 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 it's fine. I just wasn't expecting that at all. But I like how you were confident enough to tell me how you feel. It just doesn't seem like you at all. But I'm impressed. Really impressed, actually. The truth is, I kind of like you too. She trailed off, offering him a shy smile. Jacob was immediately ecstatic, like a wave of energy and happiness had just rolled through his body. But he tried to keep the rush of happiness to himself. You don't really mean that, Jacob said, smiling in return. He wasn't quite sure whether to believe her or not. Of course I do. What I lie. You're awesome, she said, reaching for his hands and wrapping them in hers. It was a failed attempt. Her hands were much smaller than his, but the gesture was cute. And she giggled adorably when she realized that she couldn't do it. Jacob was incredibly conscious of how soft her hands were, though. So, you'll go out with me then? He asked reluctantly. Yes, Jacob Olsen, I will. The two of them both seemed happy with the conversation. They stayed outside and talked for a while, but when Dean sent Jacob a text wondering if everything was okay, they went back inside as happy as he could be. They hung out with Dean for a while longer, drinking soda and eating lounge appetizers until the night took them away. And when it did... Dean left for his dorm, and soon Zoe and Jacob left for his. He and Zoe lay on his bed, and she was curled up beside him with her head resting on his chest. She liked the feeling of his chest rising and falling beneath her, and the rhythmic beating of his heart booming into her ear. Remember when I mentioned my mother died? Yeah. It's hard to forget things like that. Truthfully? It feels like there's this gaping hole inside me, and it feels like it's there because she's gone. I keep asking myself if the feeling would go away, if only I just went back to see her. Just once would probably do it. I understand. My father died when I was 13. Unlike you, I still got to meet him, but it still feels like the time we had was so short. Something huge was taken out of my life, whether I wanted it or not, and there's nothing I could do to change it, so... I can understand how you feel about wanting to know your mother. How did he die? If it's okay if I ask. He was having an operation, but there were complications. Zoe said. He could tell she was intentionally being vague as she normally would do, but he respected her privacy. She lifted her head from his chest and looked directly at him. I, I know I said not to before, but if you really want to try and meet your mother again, I'll help you do it. I don't know how you plan on doing it if she died giving birth to you, but I'll still do everything I can to help. Jacob recalled the conversation he had over winter break with his foster parents, where they basically confirmed that their original explanation for her death had been a lie. He didn't think that it was the right time to tell Zoe the truth in case he turned out to be wrong after all, but he was truly happy that she just wanted to help. I've got a hunch about something, Jacob said and offered her a reassuring smile. There was something eerily familiar about the woman his foster mother described and the woman he swore he remembered as a young child. If there was a connection between the two, anything at all, he was determined to find out. If you say so. Zoe moved to get up, sitting on her knees on the bed beside Jacob. Want to go now? The lab will be empty at this time of night. Jacob looked to the clock on his nightstand, which read just past 1 a.m. She was right, and he was tempted to take her offer and head out to the lab at that moment. Are you sure you're up for that? 
Yep. Besides, Professor Melbourne seems to be convinced that you're the only one capable of actually using the machine for its full potential, so you might as well give it a swing before time runs out, huh? I guess I was the only one who didn't know about how limited our time was. Right on cue, Zoe pulled up the long sleeve of her shirt to reveal a timer identical to the one Professor Melbourne had given him, strapped to her wrist. Guess so. And I have a key. I have to do after-hours research in the lab sometimes. Don't tell anybody, though. Professor Melbourne could get in a lot of trouble. She said. They both got up from the bed, and before they left the dorm, Zoe took his hands in hers once more. If you have the chance to meet her, you have to take it. As we conclude this episode of the Actuality Podcast, Jacob has developed a growing awareness of the profound impact of his actions. As he grapples with the consequences of his past alterations, he finds himself facing a pivotal decision. To embark on a daring experiment to reunite with his birth mother, a journey full of uncertainty and a possibility. Will Jacob have the courage to take this leap into the unknown? And how will his relationship with Zoe shake the path ahead? Find out and join us on the next episode of the Actuality Podcast.